In this latest episode of Risk Engineers Talk Governance, due diligence engineers Gay Francis and Richard Robertson talk about the Rail National Safety Law. This follows Gay's recent conference paper presentation at CORE, the Conference of Rail Excellence, recently held in Melbourne. We hope you enjoy the episode. If you do, please subscribe across your favourite podcast platform. Give us a rating and also check out the other episodes. Enjoy. Hi, Richard. Welcome back for another podcast session. Brisk, isn't it? It is very brisk today. Um, today we thought we'd talk about rail safety national law and this sort of follows on a little bit from two things. We, we currently give a rail safety national law and OHS legislation um, workshop through Engineering Education Australia. And I also gave a paper recently at the core conference, Conference on Rail Excellence. And there was a lot of interest in that and how so far and things like that. So what we'll do today is we'll outline what the legislation actually is, um, what it means and, and how you go about satisfying that legislation. So it's almost a, a, a promo for the course and, and, and the, the paper which we will attach at the end of the session as well. Thank you, yeah. So you can do the formal part. And you'll just chip in as usual. That's the one. <laughs> I've got that plan. Well, the first thing is just to understand what the Rail Safety National Law is. Now, just from a philosophical viewpoint, it was explained to us by a bunch of lawyers, there are two basic ways to have harmonised legislation. And we need this process because Australia is basically a federation. Um, basically, each state was its own little country, like Victoria had its own navy for a while there. Uh, and when we federated, they gave up the minimum powers necessary to create the federation. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have a high court, because we had state supreme courts, because they were the highest court in each of the little nations, because we had our own ambassadors to you know, London and all the rest of it. Um, and when we federated, in order to put our superior court in, we called it the high court, rather than stopping the term supreme court and you know, changing it all around. Um, one, one of the things we were supposed to sort out was, it was rail safety or rail harmonisation. The legislation sort of says we're going to have standard gauge. And we could go through a little brief history of how we got to the different gauges if anybody's got a passing interest, as carefully explained to me by a Queensland rail engineer a while back. But I guess what we're saying is that has yet to be achieved. But, you see, if we wanted to harmonise rail safety, and, for it, and literally last time I looked, if, you, if, you're changing, if you're driving a train from Sydney to Melbourne, for example, uh, and you, once you cross the border, what's it, what means go in one state apparently means stop in the other state, which has always mystified me a bit, and we haven't resolved that one yet. So kudos to train drivers, mm. I think is the first point. <clears throat> now, if you want to get around this problem of harmonisation, you have to have an intergovernment agreement. Um, and that means, like GST, all the states, because we're in a, and all the ministers from the states and the Commonwealth all have to agree and sign to, to, to take it forward. And in terms of actually harmonising legislation, there are two core ways you can do it. You can do it like the Model WHS legislation, where somebody creates a Model WHS Act, and everybody says, yep, we'll adopt that Model Act, and we'll make little additions or amendments to it to suit ourselves, uh, which is what's actually happened. Or you can do it the way they did the Rail Safety National Law, which is one parliament passes legislation, and then all the other parliaments say, yes, that's our legislation subject to these modifications. Now, in the case of Victoria, for example, the Rail Safety National Act that went through South Australia, which is the one everyone agreed to adopt, that was 191 pages, and the Victorian modifications is 160 pages, which tells you something about the way in which this implementation has gone it been done. So there's a lot of confusion because <coughs> you almost got to read both lots of of both the um, South Australian Act and then the modifications to get a full understanding of what the law is in that particular state. Yes, and it gets really quite confusing. I, I mean, um, I, I mean, even with the model harmonised WHS legislation, you know, they sort of have uh, Section 18 and then they put numbers after it when they insert their own thing. Um, right. you know, so, for example, in the Commonwealth Act, you know, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an expression in there that with regards to the Department of Defence that nothing in this Act shown to fear with the defence of the realm, basically. Um, meaning that if we're at war, then the WHS legislation, well, and pre preparation for these things, which is what the Defence Department is, um, there are certain, it, it has a certain weight on the scales which, which other civilian operations wouldn't have. Anyway, <clears throat> now, the whole point of the uh, Rail Safety National Law was it was meant to implement the core concepts under the model WHS legislation as it applies to railways. 
And that gets particularly confusing because um, when they sort of say, what, what's the difference? Well, you know, just for example, section 48, if a provision of the occupational health and safety legislation applies to railway operations, that provision continues to apply and must be observed in addition to this rail safety national law. So they're basically saying the WHS Act applies. It doesn't, the, the, the rail safety national doesn't stand instead of, it no. stands as well. Um, and if the provision of this law is inconsistent with the provision of the occupational health and safety legislation, the provision of the occupational health and safety legislation prevails to the extent of any consistency, which says it's superior to, quite specifically. And compliance with this rail safety national law with any requirement opposed on the law is not of itself a defence of proceedings against, of an offence against occupational health and safety legislation. Uh, and evidence of relevant controversy of this rail safety national law is, admiss is, is admissible in any proceedings for an offence against the occupation and safety and health legislation, which basically means it's, it's, it's superior. The health and safety legislation, legislation is superior. Yes. Um, so we find it all a little bit strange because one starts to wonder why on earth you bother having a rail safety national in the first place if all it is going to do is to apply to rail matters as opposed to any other safety obligation. But obviously two trains run into each other or a level crossing accident occurs, the provision of the WHS legislation still apply. Uh, so it's, it's, it's curious. Our understanding is that the rail regulators then have agreements with the health and safety regulators to prosecute under the OHS and WHS legislation for rail matters. Is that correct? Well, yes, except when you have a complicated matter like the level crossing accident at Wallen, Victoria, where it was a New South Wales train running on ARTC track, so it's being heard in a Victorian Magistrates' Court. Yes, yes. Which means it's rather difficult to actually separate out who's going to be responsible for these things. But see, the other point, though, is that in most jurisdictions now, they've actually stuck criminal manslaughter provisions in under the WHS legislation, so if they wanted to get you under criminal provisions, they'd have to go under the WHS legislation, not under the Rail Safety National Law. Although, obviously, the five years for recklessness, new or made, and new or made or let it happen, still applies under the um, OHS or the... The Rail uh, Safety or WHS. WHS legislation. or both. Um, the, the main difference, as far as we can tell, is that, that the uh, Rail Safety National Law applies to rail safety work. It obviously creates the regular ONSA in Adelaide um, and it obviously enables the accreditation of railways, the AR, the ARO and all those sorts of things. Um, and it promotes safety management systems as applied in the rail business. So that that, that is sort of helpful um, because otherwise how would you do that if you didn't have a separate a separate act? But the core duties are identical uh, and this, the WHS legislation takes precedence in all the terms and ways that we can see. Um, now, that sort of leads you on to sort of, well, what are you actually then going to do? Well, our observation is that if you want to satisfy your duties under the Rail Safety National Law, you've basically got to satisfy your duties under the WHS legislation. There'd be very little point in just satisfying the Rail Safety National Law and then being beaten to a pulp under the WHS legislation, you would think. Mm. So in, in, in our terms, we're really saying the SOFARP approach, so far as reasonably practical, is the modern definition of SOFARP. And um, in railway safety terms, it asks the question... If you're affected in any way by a railway network, passenger, driver, at a level crossing or a railway worker, how would you expect that network and rolling stock to be designed and managed in order for it to be considered safe? So we're really applying the SOFAR process um, to, to any, any of those rail safety matters. Well, that's right. Well, the duty's the same, so that's what you do. I mean, there's a few other points we could probably make, but I actually don't know that it actually sort of, you know, it actually comes back to our basic observation that the... The, the WHS legislation was a direct spin-off spin -off of um, due diligence as a defence against negligence in the common law, and they elevated the statute law, and then they continued that elevation through into the rail safety national law, so it became far more peculiar and, and probably effective or focused, I suppose is probably the way to put it, um, to rail operations. And that's fine, we don't have a philosophical problem with that, but, um, you know, it... it well, it's a bit like, you know, when we had that incident in Wollum with that level crossing accident there. I mean, which jurisdiction? Well, it happened in Victoria, so it has to be in Victoria, even though, as I said, it's a... It had different parties involved. Every, every, all different parties, yeah. So it's, yeah, it, it's complicated. So I guess that's the difference then between 
doing a compliance order or, or a compliance review with, you know, each the letter of each of the <coughs> legislation and, and achieving the requirements of SOFAR. Well, that, that's always been our point. There's no point in actually... I mean, I keep coming across lawyers who tell boards that what you need to do is a compliance audit. Uh, and it's probably true that if you've done a compliance audit, it probably will be difficult to prove beyond reasonable doubt on a statutory basis um, that the board and the board members were liable. Will that make their organisation safer? Probably not. And if you want to be safe, what you've got to do, first of all, is manage things to satisfy the laws of nature. Why won't the two trains collide? Mm. And then having sat and done that and demonstrated to yourself in engineering or scientific or however you terms you wish to think about it, to how, have you done that, functional safety terms, uh, 61508 and so forth, um, what makes you confident that you've done that in a way which would satisfy post-event legal scrutiny? I mean, you may recall when we did the functional safety assessment under ISC 61508 for how two trains would get past each other in New South Wales on a single line track. Your first job, as I recall, was pretty much going through every crossing, every time there was in a, a points... Um, that trains could interact. To interact, yeah. confirming that the watchdog would prevent that interaction from improperly occurring. I don't think it was one of your favourite jobs, but you did it. <laughs> and it did take a very long time. And I would remind you that in the times that when we were the certifiers and our signature, r 2 signatures were sitting on the uh, functional safety assessment in Orange, the train, well, with them, the train control in New South Wales, there were no rail accidents in that time for any of the mechanisms that we're talking about under the, well, it was TOX, train order control system, and then it turned to TMAX, train management and control system. So with any of our rail safety jobs that we do <coughs> and in line with the WHS legislation and the Rail Safety National Law, we still always go through our four processes. What's our argument for completeness? Yep. Have we got all the key, credible, critical issues on the, on the table? For all of those, what are the controls that you can put in place? The possible practical precautions, those things that can be technically done. And this is probably one of the things where railways fall down a little bit. They're, they're very narrow looking in that they're not often looking for new technology and new solutions um, to apply to railways and the application to railways. But the legislation requires you to, to look for those further controls. Are we, are we allowed to give that example of the GPS system on the sure. trains in New South Wales? Sure. Do you see, um, without going through the detail of how r got into involved in this thing, but basically what happened was that they put in this new train control system and it had a whole lot of checks in it and so forth, or at least it was supposed to have it. Uh, and then they had a near-miss incident. And um, apparently there was meant to be some redundancy in the software and the processing and all this sort of things. And it turned out that for various reasons the IT people hadn't quite got the work done. And uh, the near-miss occurred and I wasn't actually at the meeting but I heard about it afterwards that, you know, the question was, well, we had a redundant system here, why didn't it work? And the answer was from the IT people was, well, we couldn't get it working, so we just let it go with just the one system. And apparently that was a fairly chill meeting. To cut a long story short, that's where R2A turned up. And the first thing we said, we said, well, you need a, a way to independently verify where the trains are. And the obvious thing to do in this day and age, and this was 20 years ago now, was GPS. Yes. And everyone sort of looked at each other and said, retrospectively and in, in a retrofitting GPS on all trains, the freight trains that travel through New South Wales, Gruel. They said, that, that'd, be that'd be hard, that'd be long one. How can we do that? Well, quite literally found out a week later, in order to make the train control system work, you had to have good radio communications with the trains. In order to prevent ghosting between the radio towers, i.e. having trains on the same frequency, talking on the same frequency, they have towers on different frequency with different geographic coverage. In order for the train to know which tower, which frequency it was talking to, it had to, have a, had to know where it was. And in order to know where it was, the radio engineers, the communication engineers, had put GPS on the train. So it already, this control already existed? Well, that function already existed, mm. which was just absurd. Now, we only found that a week later. So the next thing to do was to say, right, let's do a trial. And the trial was basically whenever the driver pushed a push to talk, uh, the, the GPS location was encoded and sent off to train control. And that meant we could actually formulate a watchdog, which was a safety critical computer platform um, by the defence people in Adelaide, uh, running a safety critical language called ADA, um, which was a very small piece of software, which gave at least a good SIL2 um, overview of what the train and train controllers were actually doing with the train management system. 
uh, and that was the way in which it was certified, which you spent a lot of your time sorting out. And I guess that that's the third step, isn't it, determining what the reasonableness of, of each of those further controls is. You know, is it reasonable to do? Well, in that paper there, we because we, we, we do a lot of work in marine pilotage, all the marine pilots have um, you know, personal pilotage units these days, uh, which have matured vigorously over the last 30 years. They're all battery controlled. Uh, you could quite literally give a driver a marine pilotage, personal pilotage unit, and the train driver would have a genuine independent knowledge of where they were and if the communication array is working properly, what all the um, environmental factors around the track would be, uh, where all the track gangs are and everything. And because the, um, the pilotage guys have got, the marine pilotage guys have got so good at it, it's looking at, I think, all eight satellite systems now, uh, Galileo, the Europeans, uh, the American GPS, the R Russians, the Indians, the Japanese, the Chinese. There are so many satellite navigation systems. The, these things are known now to the centimetre where they are. And they also have to put in, you know, G3 and G4 and G5 communications, and they're all toughened up and robust to prevent um, hacking and all sorts of things these days. Um, and to do that for a train driver is probably $3,000 a unit and probably $50,000, at least five, at least $50 million, to code all rail, train and rail tracks up to, to, to handle that sort of where are we and what are we doing here sort of thing. Um, but that's one of the other points, isn't it? Technology becomes or has advanced so much in the last 10 and 15 years that... You know what, what may not have been reasonable twenty years ago is entire may entirely be reasonable now. Ubiquitous, I think, is the word you're seeking. Yes, um, and then the last step, of course, is to make sure you've got a quality control system to make sure that what you say you're going to do remains in place and remains um, robust and and effective. Yeah, people keep forgetting. I mean, from the legal point of view, so safety means you don't want it to go wrong. But from a legal point of view, liability only arises because of inadequate, insufficient or failed precautions. It doesn't arise because something's risky. Mm. So that, that's the nonsense. I keep talking, people keep talking about riskiness and I think, they don't know what you're talking about. The question is sofa upiness, not riskiness. I don't know that sofa upiness is actually a word, but... Well, well, sofa up isn't a word either, actually. <laughs> um, so I hope... I hope you've enjoyed the podcast today. We just wanted to run through that there is some confusion with the um, Rail Safety National Law and its interaction with the WHS legislation. Um, but we've all the rail organisations that we've talked to said that if you satisfy the requirements of the WHS legislation, you have in turn satisfied the requirements of the Rail Safety National Law. So thank you for enjoying joining us again. Thanks, Richard. And um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Kay.